come and dream with me. Hello, welcome to What Do You Want to Watch? The Explosion Network's premium media podcast. Every week we get together to talk about movies, TV, and online content and help you answer the question, is Disney really putting all physical media back in the vaults? Seems like it. I'm your host, Ash Lovely. Joining me today, Dylan Blight. And I think I've been more angry at Disney in recent... I mean, there's a lot of reasons lately, but... Very disappointed. Uh, so, for context, <laughs> uh, Sanity uh, posted on their Facebook page, Farewell to Disney's physical media in Australia. Act fast and don't miss out on your last chance to own your favorite Disney classics, MCU flicks, Star Wars movies, and more at Sanity. Uh, before linking to a catalog of Disney's Fox properties, uh, they also posted underneath their post to help clear up any confusion or questions. There is no way we would post this if we didn't know what was happening. Guidance of the Galaxy will be the last pre-order. Uh, so I'm reading this from Always On, uh, and Shannon uh, has looked around for like Little Mermaid, which released after the Guidance of the Galaxy, and there's currently no listings uh, with any Australian re- retailer for pre-orders for a Little Mermaid physical edition. So, it looks like uh, they're going to stop making Blu-rays, DVDs here in Australia, for Australians. Anyway. Just making it more difficult. <laughs> I mean, there's part of me that's like, A, we obviously did it to ourselves, because people aren't buying enough here for them to, to keep making them. But also, B, this is terrible. Yeah. I mean, maybe we just need to start in pop biz. <laughs> Might need to, because I, in, the, in the same week, I've got this clip of Christopher Nolan sticking up for physical media going around, so, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very weird. Like, I understand, you know, the costs. It's it's much cheaper to, like, you make more money by pushing people towards digital storefronts. And, and like, they can just take them off whenever they want. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you can get rid of them. Like, nobody... They're like, did you want to watch Willow? Yeah, too bad. We didn't make a Blu-ray and we've removed it. Fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Now, what are you going to do? Tweet us it forever? Yep. Can't even do that. Can't even do it. Can't even tweet at them anymore. Go yell into the void, you little babies. (laughs) Who want your discs and your Willows. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, On today's episode, we'll be talking about watching Watch the Tree, going over some film news. Uh, give us some thumbs to trailers and talk about this week's top three. Of course, the big releases of the week. Uh, Barbenheimer happens. Uh, the event that we've all been waiting for. Um, yeah, we've got some spoiler casts up on the podcast feed. Uh, but starting off with Barbie, of course, the Greta Gerwig directed Margot Robbie starring film about Barbie the toy uh, with Ryan Gosling as the Sir Stealing Ken. Uh, if you don't know what it's about, doesn't matter. Just go see the movie, <laughs> Dylan. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on Barbie? Uh, yeah, obviously. I'm, I mean, that's just safe. Both. Both these movies are really good. I'm really happy to see them both doing really well. Um, Barbie is everything I thought it would kind of be to a point, and then so much more. I think it sort of falls off my only criticism is I do feel like the ending sort of it doesn't really know that, I don't feel like they really struggled with how to end this movie and what the how they ended up ending it. I feel like it's not up to the same color. Have you, have you read some of the people trying to explain how the ending? Yes. Works. I still disagree. Yeah. It doesn't still mean I need to don't, agree. Don't think it works. Like, yeah. No, it, for me, it still doesn't work. I mean, I'm not a fucking, like, I, just because I read something, I go, yeah, right, I, that's your take. Cool. So um, I disagree. I feel like it's, it's still like falters uh, in, mm. the, in the ending. It doesn't really, I'm sorry, spending too long on this now. Anyway, the movie's fantastic. Uh, anyway, uh, fantastic performances from everyone involved. Obviously, Ryan Gosling is going to get most of the shout outs because he is the uh, funniest, uh, most loud character in the movie. However, everyone's really, really fantastic. Uh, such great set design and production value that's gone into this entire movie. Um, really stand out. Even seen that clip going around today of them filming um, the, the, car. The, the car stuff, and that was an actual scene on a, like a conveyor belt thing instead of just in front of a green screen. And seeing that, which is like, to me, that's like sort of more movie magic than like, oh, it's a green screw. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. sort of like how the, seeing how the, what's the saying? Seeing how the sausage is made. Sausage is made. Yeah. Stuff like that's more interesting than, yeah, behind the scenes stuff where it's just green screen. Um, 
yeah, no, really, really good. Fantastic soundtrack. I'm trying to listen to the soundtrack pretty much nonstop. Um, overall, one of the most crazy success stories I feel like in recent movie history is a Barbie movie doing as well as this. Not only doing as well as this, but also being deservingly um, as good as it is. So, yeah, yeah, completely agree. It is super fun, super funny. Ryan Gosling, hilarious. I listened to I Am Ken. I'm just Ken like several times. Um, I look forward to watching like the proper segment from the film rather than the cut up, you know. Uh, oh, so the one that they, the one they've released isn't the okay. So they've re- they've got the soundtrack version, but like they've yeah, got a yeah, music yeah. video version, which is just yeah. parts of the movie cut together. Um, that's super fun. I think yeah, it is super enjoyable. Uh, lots of fun jokes. Just the it's been fun watching people get certain people get angry about the film uh because of some of the messaging and some of the jokes um yeah just a such a delight not a kids movie i feel like that is a disclaimer that needs to be put out there very much uh definitely aiming for an older audience i mean the movie's going to hit hardest for 30 to 4 year olds really women i feel like rather than kids um but, you know, I think uh, it's still very family-friendly for the most part. Uh, great performances across the board. America Ferrera gets a shining moment, um, as well as, you know, a lot of the Kens are really hilarious. Uh, Will Ferrell does his Will Ferrell thing. Margot Robbie, uh, I feel like she's got the hardest task because her character kind of is a straight person for the most part. Um, but, you know, Super enjoyable. Kate McKinnon's really great as well. Uh, yeah, definitely very happy with how Barbie turned out. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into the numbers in a sec. But uh, the other side of the Barbie Homer, phenomenal. Heimer. The Heimer of the Oppenheimer. Mm. No, uh, Heimer of the Barbie Heimer, Oppenheimer. <laughs> uh, of course, the latest Christopher Nolan film, uh, delving into the life of Robert Oppenheimer, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb uh who led the manhattan project um fantastic movie looks incredible stellar performances by so many members of the cast people who have some people who have like very small roles but make the most of them um it's incredibly star-studded i will say that it's like possibly distracting for some people um if you if you get pulled out of movies by w- wondering who people are like you know, it's like, oh, I, do, I don't recognize that person. What do what I remember, remember them from? You could suffer from that. But I feel like the story is so incredibly told with this uh, non-linear storytelling, these multiple timelines acting at the same time, uh, which is, it takes a little while to get into the, the flow of, but once it does, it like super fun, uh, even though it is touching on such dark, terrible subject matter. Uh, Cillian Murphy, incredible as Rapid Up and Ima. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. giving his best acting performance in years, like before Tony Stark, like if people can remember that far. Um, yeah, just a incredible work. Again, so much of it done practically. Um, yeah, just a definitely a film you need to see in cinemas. Dylan, what do you think of Oppenheimer? Oh, fantastic! It's it's. Absolutely, everyone running it. They're top marks as far as movies go, in my opinion. Like it's it's just this three hour epic story, but an an epic in the way of like standardized, like just as a story. Like it's not there is, I was gonna say there's no mass explosions, but there's a mass explosion. But the majority of the the movie is epic in the how what the story is about affects the world and like forever changes it and stuff like that, rather than just like you know an avengers film or or whatever like that the Mm. scale of it and stuff um yeah i i just also appreciate like yes there there are actors who have like five minute roles but i think it's just because nolan i i think like so few directors now do it's like every person in a movie like has to be good and having someone like rami malik come in and only do five six minutes on screen but all of those moments apparently it was only there one day 
Yep, that adds up. <laughs> All of those moments being important, especially like having a key moment uh, at the end of the movie. Like, I think he just understands that it doesn't matter. It's not. It's not. It doesn't matter if you're in, in it for an hour, three hours, five, ten minutes. Like, everyone should be good. Like, everyone should be great. Even you know what I mean. Like from so, I th- I think that's just sort of what it comes down to. There are no bit players. They're all part of the the moving picture, the moving story. So. Um, yeah, fantastic soundtrack, original score for this this film by Ludwig, which is great as well. Um, I, I, another film I can't wait to see behind the scenes stuff of more because I just don't understand how a lot of it was made and done. Um, and not as as extravagant as Barbie, but uh, great costume design and um, period set stuff that's happening here as well. Phenomenal performances from everyone involved in the cast, from Cillian Murphy, who gives this sort of more like less extravagant performance more although his his tone does change throughout the film is mostly of a he's he's a man of um you know keeps his emotions to himself for the most part until that last act i guess to a degree uh but yeah then, then you've got like emily blunt florence Pugh, robert downey jr um uh, uh josh fucking hunt it Arnett, who's got amazing comeback now off this movie, I feel, or hopefully, like if if he if he can get the, his his uh, agent help booking correctly <laughs> after this, but well, after the the, the strike too, I guess is uh, <laughs> it'll do another part of that. Uh, but yeah, amazing movie, definitely going to be in my top ten. I highly doubt it's going to not be in my top ten for the year. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, looking at the numbers, I'm reading from Variety. Uh, Second, uh, no, reading from Deadline. Uh, Barbie Hartman together grossed more than $511 million worldwide, uh, $235.5 million domestic. Never before in the history of Hollywood have two films open to $100 million plus and $50 million plus at the domestic box office. Uh, as of Sunday, Warner Brothers counts a domestic opening of $155 million with $182 million abroad, while Oppenheimer got $80.5 million domestic and a $93.7 million um so that make so for barbie that makes it the largest opening of 2023 besting super mario brothers 146.4 million dollars uh the largest grossing day of 2023 year to date with 70.8 million besting super mario's uh 54.8 million dollars it's the largest opening for a female directed film stateside outstripping captain marvel's uh 153.4 million uh Second highest opening by a woman film worldwide, uh, behind Captain Marvel. Uh, it's the largest non sequel, non remake film released in July, <laughs> beating uh, The Secret Life of Pets back in 2016. Uh, it's the largest domestic opening for Greta Gerwig, for Margot Robbie, for Ryan Gosling. Uh, it's the, now the largest opening weekend for a movie based on a toy. Prior was Dark, Transformers Dark of the Moon with $115.9 million. Uh, it's also the largest WB non-sequel, non-DC opening, uh, higher than uh, it. And it also surpassed, in one weekend, it also surpassed the lifetime grosses of many other female-led movies, including Ocean's 8, Birds of Prey, and Little Women. Uh, on the Oppenheimer front, uh, Christopher Nolan's third highest grossing opening weekend ever, both globally and domestic behind The Dark Knight Rises and The Dark Knight. Uh, it's the biggest global opening date uh, opening weekend ever for a biopic outpegging uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, which made $124 million. Uh, it's the highest grossing opening weekend uh, for an R-rated film, beating out John Wick. And uh, yeah, the biggest opening day for a Nolan film in 33 markets, including, including Saudi Arabia, UAE, India, Netherlands, Argentina, and Belgium. So a massive success. Uh Dylan, what lessons do you think Hollywood is going to learn from this Barbenheimer phenomenon? Uh, if we grab a film based on a property and do a biopic, good or bad, they will do well if, mar- if they're marketed. And that is not a true statement. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're going to take all the wrong. They're going to take all the the wrong lessons from it. I've seen enough people um, zeke out their thoughts and uh, say things like, um, 
you know, the the moral of the story here is that not only, yes, there was marketing involved to success these movies. But that, I don't feel like that's a bad thing. People always say it like it's a negative, but like that's why films have marketing budgets. And if the marketing budget doesn't do well, then what the fuck was the point of the marketing budget? Uh, but it was marketed well, but they're also both really good fucking movies that then led to a good word of mouth that continued to get people coming in for the days and uh, and will for the weeks following this point um and that's going to help lead to success it, it wasn't just because it became a meme because last time we thought a movie being a <laughs> meme led to success we had morbius. fucking morbius <laughs> put back into theaters and no one went and watched it so yes movie studios love to take all the wrong wrong things and read them the, the, the way they want yeah hopefully the lesson is the hope, lessons I hope they learn is one, make good movies. That's key. Two, practical. Because everything in Barbie is super practical. Everything in Oppenheimer is super practical. That still super counts. Um, people are kind of tiring on the CGI fuck this, um that we're seeing all the time. I feel like they'll. The star studdedness of all the casts will be. I would agree. A, I mean. Would be a thing they'll pl- kind of pick up on. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you like we see very large ensemble casts for big projects. Um, but the thing they should learn is there's no replicating this. No, <laughs> you know this was just a one-off phenomenon because these two things, complete opposites, mm. same day. Um, I mean, if the, if the other lesson is, uh, you know. Warner Brothers trying to screw, like, have some sort of vendetta against somebody it doesn't work out because obviously they did put Barbie against Oppenheimer as a fu to Christopher Nolan, who uh, left Warner Brothers after the whole tenant uh, slash everything being on HBO Max thing, um, and it it boosted that film <laughs> really, the whole phenomenon. Um, I mean, yeah, I've so- seen so. Local, my local theater that I went to watched it. People still dressing up. The other indie theater, I've got pictures on people on Facebook. People dressing up. I see people on social media doing their whole dress ups where their dresses transform between black and pink when they go from one screening to another. Yeah, like you just can't replicate this. Like is the is the thing. Not and, yeah, you can't force it. Yeah, no, and it's none of it even is cheesy to me. Like it's just sort of so wholesome <laughs> like yeah. like they're just two really good movies and people are enjoying going out and watching them and it, people putting in effort to get transforming dresses done so they can enjoy them i'm like this is all just good you know i mean shut yeah. the fuck up when you get in the theater and watch the movie but <laughs> after that after that up to that point yeah. like I'm, I'm like this is all good yeah all right last thing is bob and homer actually a good double feature um no I well yeah if you want to do it anyway I'd say you watch Oppenheimer no no sorry you watch Barbie and then Oppenheimer <laughs> so that is the correct way to watch it but um I don't I mean, think it's actually the name good. so I mean... yeah yeah so that is the correct way to watch it because if you watch Oppenheimer first you'll be you even Barbie can't pull you out of the, the emotional roller coaster that movie ends you with so but you That's... don't think it's a good double vision I mean. It's a fine double feature because now historically, well, that, that's the thing. Like prior to this, prior to it becoming a cultural pinpoint, I would say no. Now that it is a cultural pinpoint, then I suppose yes, it is a good double feature because it's always now going to have the name Barberheimer. And so yes, I changed yeah. my answer. Yes, it's a good double feature. <laughs> yeah, I think from that standpoint, like uh, from a historical sense, I guess now it is a good double feature. But as two singular movies. I don't think they work back to back. No, I wouldn't have backed them up back to back. No, no. But even even Quentin Tarantino went and watched them back to back. So you know, and he loves a good double feature. So yeah, um, yeah, because they are so distinctly different mm. uh, in tone, in color, in everything. You know, which can be fine in some aspects. But I feel like just you know, I would my preference would be to watch both the singly. Yeah. Have the time to reflect. You know, on I watched both. one per night, and that sort yes. of worked out well for me. Yeah. So yeah, uh, will we ever see Barbenheimer two? No, probably not. <laughs> I hope not. 
I, I'm saying right now, I, I don't think a sequel to Barbie, although I'm sure they'll probably try and get that. I think that's a dumb idea. No, they get yeah. sequels to both of these movies are very terrible. I just, dumb idea. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's move on to some other stuff. Uh, Dylan, you've watched Good Omen Season 2 about to release this, start releasing this week on Prime Video. Uh, yes, to clarify, I've watched the first five episodes, I guess, out of six. So I haven't seen the the finale, but, you know, I've seen most of the series. Uh, Good Omen Season 2, it is more of Good Omen. So if you enjoyed the first season of Crowley, David Tennant, and uh, uh, Zerofell, Michael Sheen, uh, going around in the first season trying to secretly put a stop to the apocalypse, more or less, with the the demigod or son of uh, Satan or whatever the, the thing was with that one, um, and you enjoyed the, the tonal style of that show, because it has a style um and the the type of characters the back and forth the 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 mix of oh my god it's diet's end of world with eh, just some fun banter between david Tennant and michael sheen um if that was all ticking boxes for you then tune right into good omen season two because it's more of that uh i can't say if it's better or worse it's just i'm just i'm it's been years since watching the first season and i did a quick like just quick synopsis of the first season to catch myself back up in case there was any references and stuff. And of course there are a couple, but for the most part, you can drop into this without remembering or having probably even watched the first season. Pretty much the story is that um, the season starts and Crowley and uh, Zerofell have sort of been, I guess, punished slash not punished for their crimes in the first season. Uh, they're like sort of kicked out of their positions in heaven and hell and but they're not punished they're sort of just left on earth to do whatever they want i guess or just hopefully shut the fuck up and not cause any more issues um but then um archangel uh uh what's his name Ga- what is his name gabriel gabriel sorry yeah. gabriel played by john ham shows up in the first episode to uh, uh zero fell's library bookshop or what ha- what have you which it's a bookshop but he doesn't really sell books he just keeps it closed all the time um the shows up there and he's butt naked and he can't remember who he is and so that's sort of the the setup for the rest of the season because then you've got agents from heaven trying to find him and you've got agents from hell trying to find him and similar to the first season where the, the you had uh, crowley and aziraphale trying to like work for their sides while also not work for their sides at the same time to help each other. Um, that's pretty much what's going on in this season. They're trying to play dumb and keep it a secret. And, they, you know, they're, they're trying to do what's actually best. They're not not really over here. Um, the other thing of this season that's really good is I think nearly every episode, apart from the premiere, has basically a mini story so say like let's say 30 minutes of the episode is set in the current present day story around there might be a 15 to 20 minute at times basically mini episode of something else for that for that episode that either kicks off the episode or is like set in the middle of it and it's even written by someone else completely different and these are all stories that are set prior to the they're like set years prior you know like 1800s 1700s whatever like throughout history um you know the events in these stories do tie into the present day stuff but you get to see a lot more of Aziraphale's and Crowley's history in 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 times and one of the, like there's, there's a really good story um with them like dealing with a um what do you call it like a, uh someone who's like digging up a corpse to try and like sell it uh to a doctor who was like trying to um, because they want to do experiments or whatever, yeah, like a, a grave digger sort of storyline. And then they come across it, and of course Crowley's like, "I'll help you. I'll pull the cart so we can take this dead body to <laughs> to someone." And Azira Fell's like, "No, you can't do that. This is, you know, blasphemous." And oh, the the typical sort of back and forth, and how all that plays out was really really good. Um, there's a bu- there's a bunch of new human characters in it because the a lot of the present day storyline stuff is centered in in and around the pretty much the street that the bookshops set in and like the the people that run the different shops there um and their interactions so like there's a a woman who's coming in to buy coffee from the coffee shop and she's in love with the coffee shop owner uh but she's like in a relationship with a really abusive partner and that's sort of a storyline told out through through the rest of it and then you've got um 
there's like someone who runs a magic shop and like all these like little very like nook area of uh england or london or wherever it's set um and what's what's happening there but the standout of the season uh is still a hundred percent just seeing david Tennant and michael sheen just do these characters they just embody them so well and their 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 dialogue and their back and forth and their chemistry is just sort of like the shining beacon of the, the entire show i think um especially seeing david Tennant back in this role i just absolutely love the way there's i remember sitting there watching one of the episodes where he's just like walking backwards and forth in the bookshop and he does like a whole little swagger walk and like the way he wears his glasses like the way he just like tries to do the full like i'm evil thing i just find so fun so um yes 100 percent recommend a if you haven't watched good omens season one rectify that because it's great and then two everyone should watch good omens season two so far because it's yeah definitely one of my favorite things i've watched uh, t- television series so far this year it's just so much fun awesome uh so the bear season two finally released on disney plus it's fantastic if you enjoyed the bear season one you should be watching season two. And if you're you watching my review, you cop my review of Good Omens. <laughs> exactly the same. Uh, kind of. Um, <laughs> yeah, you should be watching the bear. Um, definitely, it, you know, taking the characters um, and growing them even more, uh, a lot more standard, kind of a, f- a lot more character focused episodes, I feel like. Uh, like, um, the second season focuses on the restaurant rebranding itself as like a high end restaurant and like FX. all the different. No, <laughs> um, getting like getting all the staff to like learn new skills and like go out and uh, explore and get get new uh, yeah inspiration and that kind of stuff. Um, really enjoyable. Um, it still like can be super tense at times, despite being a quote unquote comedy. Uh, but there are very lots of funny situations and um, you know jokes uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, Abiella plays uh, Kami's sister this, uh, and she gets a little bit more of an expanded role this season. Um, I feel like Jeremy Allen White, like fantastic in the lead role, still as Kami. Um, and there's the so going into this show, obviously it had been playing in the States for a while. There's an episode that everybody's been calling one of the episodes of the season of the year, uh, episode six fishes. And I agree. It is, is a te- it's, it's an incredibly tense hour plus long episode of television, um, that will hit close to home for a lot of people. Um, which is crazy because, yeah, every other episode's like 35, 36 minutes. This one's like an hour, six. Um, yeah. And it, this season, incredibly star-studded. Like, a lot of people must have, like, really liked this first season and, like, agreed to come on board. Uh, I don't want to spoil uh, who comes in, but there's a certain actress who has popped up in other things all of a sudden that, you know, was a delight to see uh, in the show again. So, uh, Yeah incredibly fun look at working in a kitchen um tying into like all the covid stuff and all the closures of a lot of restaurants and that kind of stuff that comes kind of this uh looming plot point uh as they're j- tr- racing to try and open this restaurant in a very short period of time um yeah i would highly recommend the bear um so check that out on disney plus uh, I watched the documentary Stephen Curry Underrated, which is currently playing at Apple TV Plus. Um, kind of, fo- kind of following the career of Stephen Curry. Of course, he played for the Golden State Warriors, four championships, uh, cut between his uh, the twenty two twenty three season where they did win the championship, but mostly focused on like his high school days through to his run his time at Davidson College, um, and a lot of focus on that. Um, yeah, it, it's enjoyable. I mean, if you care about basketball, um, Stephen Curry is like a really interesting guy and like very charismatic and that kind of stuff. Uh, very likable. Um, you know, he's clearly the story of a guy who physically is not obviously a basketball player, um, but was able to overcome those issues to become, you know, a champion of the game. Three point, uh, 
three point record holder. Um, but yeah, like it's a pretty sub, a pretty standard documentary focusing on those kind of two timelines. Um, so yeah, check that out on Apple TV plus. I also checked out angel city. So this is a documentary series, three episode documentary series on binge, uh, following the creation of the angel city FC, uh, national women's soccer league club in the, uh, Los Angeles, um, so this is notable because it's uh, the ownership is completely by females, uh, women's. Uh, it's got like a bunch of celebrities, but also uh, a bunch of uh, former women's national, like US national team players involved in the ownership. Uh, like everyone from the top down is pretty much like a woman, like in positions of power um, and kind of tracks their first season uh, as part of the national women's soccer league um yeah it's it's not re- welcome to Wrexham, but it's uh enjoyable like uh obviously you get a bunch of celebrity appearances like uh like natalie portman is like one of the top people or one of the very starting founders of the of the club and that kind of stuff so she's like heavily featured um you get interviews with like all the players and the coaching staff and that kind of stuff. And yeah, kind of documenting this first season. Um, it's enjoyable enough. It's not the best sports documentary you'll watch, but uh, definitely uh, important because of what they're attempting to do here. And like the story of this club, which raised the standards and the interest in the soccer league where they would be drawing massive crowds. Uh, and then every single like a, uh, every other team that would go face would get higher crowd attendance and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, very interesting in that respect. Uh, and then the last documentary I watched this week, uh, Judy Bloom forever. So this is an Emmy do- nominated, uh, documentary about Judy Bloom, uh, children's right, children's book author, um, known for mostly for, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. Uh, Tales of Fourth Grade, Nothing, D. Ah, that's the movie that's coming out, right? Yeah. Uh, so she's, I feel like she's she's an American author. Mm. Definitely one who didn't, well, well, I feel like. No, not to swing through. back, but w- we know this because we watched the trial for that movie. I was like, from the beloved, most known book. And we yeah. were like, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it was interesting to watch this documentary because they're talking to like a bunch of people about different books and that kind of stuff. Like none, none. I've never heard of any of these books, uh, so it's very American censored, uh, you know. Because obviously here in Australia, we we just had a bunch of different children's authors. I feel like um, Paul Jennings, Paul Jennings, Craig Gleitz, Gleitzman. I think. Yes. Yeah. Toads. Yes. <laughs> yep. Those two. Eden Blyden. Eden Blyden. We only got. We, <laughs> I don't think she's Australian, but. Uh, yeah, so just kind of goes through her career and like um, how she's how she ended up becoming kind of this controversial figure with like because she didn't shy away from talking about sexual topics uh, like masturbation and menstruation and teen sex and of course if you've got those kind of things in your books uh, Americans they want to ban that shit so uh, you know just uh, how how they're dealing with that so uh, yeah. That's a, I think, an interesting look at a person I've never heard of before <laughs> who clearly had, like, a massive impact on uh, a lot of American culture. Also, a really interesting thing is she would she would get extensive um, letters from fans, uh, like, divulging all their secrets and that kind of stuff to, like, talking to her, like, as if she was their diary or whatever. Um, and she would, like, respond to certain people as well and like they kind of document some of the relationship she's fostered through the letters that she received and that kind of stuff so that that was a very interesting part of the documentary as well so all right that's everything in our watch history let's move into a little bit of film news uh and it looks like uh we could be in for more delays of movies um of course with the writers slash directors uh, writers slash actor strike at the moment uh, several movies look like they could be potentially be moved to 2024 with Dennis Villeneuve's sci-fi epic Dune 2 uh, potentially moving to 2024. Um, we've already already seen films like Challenges, 
uh, drop out of Venice uh, this week and uh, move to April next year. Uh, I think it was White Bird, the Wonder, the Wonder spin-off movie that's also been moved, uh, as well as there was a third one. Clearly not that important, but yeah, uh, looks like a bunch of Warner Brothers movies are potentially going to be moved uh, in the wake of the strike uh, due to uh, not being able to be uh, do the press. I feel like is the massive uh, thing. So uh, Aquaman, The Lost Kingdom, and The Color Purple are two other films that could be t- potentially be moved uh, to next year. Um, yeah, Dylan, do you think we're going to be short on big boss- blockbuster films at the end of this year? Um, hopefully not. Is that a <laughs> <laughs> well? I mean, in a perfect world, it would all be resolved in the next couple yeah. of days. If 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 we're not because they still have to be on strike, then it is what it is, and that's 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 fine. I accept it. In a perfect world, they the like, yeah. In a perfect world, then studios can pay up and I can get some movies and cinemas still. Hmm. If if movies slow down for the rest of the year, though, I'm honestly not really fussed. I know that's... <laughs> uh, well, I'm off two months. I'm off two months. Because, A, if movies slow down, cinemas don't get movies. So that sucks for cinemas. Hopefully they'll be able to play some stuff to still draw people in, but obviously it's like sort of that will affect them, which is the other problem. I think people don't... That's the side that you, it's... Like, you sort of forget about, like, you need, not only do you need the new movies to release, so they release, but also so cinemas have people to come in and spend money there, <laughs> you know? So there's that side. But then, of course, there's the other side of my my mind that's just like, if that's what's going to happen, I'm not too fast. I've got enough, you know. I'm, I'm not fast. For, I'm not going to be at a loss for stuff to watch, is, is how I feel. Yeah. Um... I think we'll definitely still be seeing stuff at the end of the year. I don't know. I feel like the next couple of weeks is definitely going to be telling. Like, um, Oppenheimer and Barbie are not the best thing to go off because obviously they had like a massive marketing push uh, before they released. But if like the Meg 2 comes out and nobody cares because I've seen no marketing, Jason Statham and the crew Wrong. Out pushing that. Everyone cares about the Meg 2. Nobody knows about the Meg Two, <laughs> and um, you know the marketing push isn't there, and nobody's talking about it, uh, and it bombs. Like um, we're talking about it. I mean, we're talking about it, you know, because it's a shark movie, and we know certain people love sharks. Um, yeah, I feel like we will see a bunch of stuff move. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. But I don't think we. I don't think everything on the slate will be moving. It's just potentially like the the biggest things. I think the cha- moving of Challenger is quite interesting because um, it's not exactly the biggest budget. Like the trailer did, like got a lot of attention, um, and then moving to April as well. I guess they're like because that push, kind of pushes it to next year's award cycle. Mm. Um, whether that's like they know it's not going to be competing in that or whether uh you know they think it or they think moving it there because they're hoping that that will get them the most return on their investment i don't know yeah it's going to be very interesting to see things moving around but yes uh can i just say so i just had a quick look out of curiosity um not to go back to something you're talking about five minutes ago but that's exactly what i'm gonna do are you there god it's me margaret currently the highest movie on rotten tomatoes hmm just as a side note to that. Yeah. No release date. No release date here in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just like her books. Talk about going to move <laughs> tie, tying these in. Something to talk about five minutes ago to movies coming to cinemas. There's one yeah, that's not like if, if none of these movies come out, hopefully then all the movies that have come out we haven't gotten. Yeah, they've already had like their press cycles and whatever else. It's like we'll just fucking release them then. We'll just replay all those. When do when can I watch Past Lives? August. Which is on VOD in America this week. End of August. End of August, right. Well, for most people. (laughs) Most cinemas, like um I don't know if you'll you know what Double check what it's like coming up against. 
Uh, it's coming up, released the same day as the Haunted Mansion, so don't like your chances. Correct. Statement. Statement correct. When did I watch Talk To Me? I don't know. The, you take that up with... <laughs> with your cinema um yeah so i guess it's going to be interesting to see you know uh you know after years of movies being delayed because of covid you know now we've got some other reason for movies not to come out so very exciting uh other interesting story netflix's paid password sharing plan resulted in 5.9 million new subscribers uh unpopular though it was across the world netflix paid password sharing plan has proved to be a big success for the pro for the company uh the streaming service received reported to have uh its second quarter earnings in 2023 and beat wall street's expectations with 8.2 billion dollars in revenue and 1.8 billion in profits none of which apparently they can pay to their riders um correct netflix reported 5.9 million users for the quarter compared to losing a million subscribers in an absolutely disastrous second quarter in 2022 uh, Netflix has said the cancel reaction was low. And while we're still in the early stages of monetization, we're seeing healthy conversion of borrower households into full paying Netflix memberships, as well as the uptake of our extra member feature. We are revenue and paid membership positive. This is prior to the launch of the paid sharing across every region in our latest launch. Uh, does this news surprise you? And do you think uh, other streaming services are taking note? I don't think this surprised me. I feel like this is, this makes sense. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, you know, I'm like that. That we you always like to talk about how everyone will just like disappear and run off, but they won't. More people. No, everybody's a bunch of liars. Everyone's a bunch. Yeah, it's just like that. The loud, the loud minority online, you know, sort of thing. But no, none of this surprised me. I think I think this is sort of what I talked about when we discussed the the change that I thought would probably happen anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's surprising, but, you know, it is a very big number, <laughs> uh, 5.9 million, but, you know, that's just how many exes were, like, stuck on their partners, Netflix, and just didn't probably, realize. Probably true. Yeah, you know, so. Uh, I, and I would not be surprised if a bunch of other streaming services follow suit. Uh, if you can get an extra 5.9 million people uh, subscribing to your service just by, you know, kicking off... Uh, you know, people who aren't in the same household, like, I think, especially these money-hanging companies uh, would be very on board doing that, so. Why not? Yeah. You know, it sucks to be you if you've, you've been, you know, stealing other people's streaming services. You have to be paying for them soon. Uh, that's all the news we've got for this week. Uh we're going to do an update on our what do you want to watch movie fantasy league of course uh earlier in the year we pick, each picked 10 movies uh and we got a convoluted system in which to earn points based on uh rotten tomatoes critic score as well as box office performance um we're going to pick a couple of extra films uh leading into the last six months of the year which is going to be more interesting now because you know uh <laughs> of the uh potential delays of anything big uh but score updates uh so i am currently in the lead with 146 points dylan is behind on 122 interestingly when i checked this last week i was up 146 to 77 and then barbie and Oppenheimer released (laughs) 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 and that score quickly quickly came much closer uh, so on the bo- worldwide box office at the moment, Barbie is at number eleven. So technically, it doesn't hasn't scored any box office points yet. That will likely change yes. next week, or by now, or potentially by now. We don't know. Um, so that gap is closing very quickly. All of our movies have currently come out except for one. Well, we're doing pretty good then. I have. Dune Part Two. <laughs> Full. So, um, yeah, this is much closer than I was expecting it to be. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be uh, interesting to see how this pans out for the end of the year. Um, yeah, 
So Oppenheimer is the highest scoring critic score film. Uh, it's currently sitting at 87 uh, critic score on Rotten Spiders. So that netted you 34 points and will probably net more when the box office. How'd I get Oppenheimer rests. and Barbie? I don't know. Yeah. I thought it was and uh, Oppenheimer, Barbie wasn't even your second pick. So run through the list. I picked Spider Man across Spider Verse. Then you picked Oppenheimer. I picked Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning. Then you picked Scream Six. I picked Dune Part Two, and then you picked Barbie. So that's how that panned out. I was ahead of the curve. I, I knew Barbie was going to be good before the 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 pop pop cultural sensation took off. I'll also point out that you currently have three negative scoring uh, films in your. All right. Top eight, uh, in Super Mario, well, critically. Uh, like Super Mario made money. Super Mario, Fast X, and uh, Magic Mike's Last Dance all got got below the 60 point threshold and earned you negative points. But, Fucking Steven uh, Soderbergh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, currently Super Mario Brothers is the number one box office film. So, netting, yeah. You also picked as a wild card 65. So, I mean, I don't. Your, ju- your judgment's not that great. I got Barbie and Oppenheimer. <laughs> I think it's All fine. Right. <laughs> Tell me your negative picks. My one negative. Uh, I picked Ant Man and, and the Wasp. Yeah. You and one, with you my pick, number eight pick. And so. now what happened? That one's up I for mean, That one, I was ever going to watch that again. It's currently still netting me five five points because it's in the books the number six of the box office so what was your wild card my wild cards were dungeon dragons and cocaine bear yeah fair your other wild card was knock at the cabin yeah. all right so we're going to pick three films each uh leading to the end of the year dylan because you're currently trailing you get first pick Oh, I wrote down a lot of things. So, oh, fuck. I'm going to go with The Nun 2. Wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean, what? Uh, this movie, A, I'm trying to... A, there's three things to think about right now. It's yes. A, will this movie release? <laughs> or will it get delayed? Yes. Then B, will this movie make money? To which I think this movie will make money and get released. Okay, yeah. And three, do I think this movie will perform above a 60? To which I'm saying, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So the current threshold, I would say, to get into the top 10 is $240 million worldwide. Oh, no. Look in the wrong number. $427 million worldwide. Assuming Oppenheimer and Barbie are going to get into the top 10, which mm. I think they will. So, yeah. So this, has, this is a film has to make $430 million to get box office points i think you underestimate how popular these conjuring film universes are film universe films are could be so, yeah all right none too that's your pick uh my first pick is going to be teenage mutant ninja turtles mutant mayhem that's your name really isn't that movie is definitely coming out there is no. so much marketing for that movie they don't need people it's no. animated uh you know, it's the IP is so big that they, I don't think they need the the press. So I'm pretty sure that's going to come out soon. Dylan, what's your second pick? My second pick is going to be Strays. Okay. Because I, too, want to bite a dick off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, potentially. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that that's a pretty solid pick. You know. Okay, thank you. That last time you had you know, my pick, and now you're I think you'll get a couple of points for that. Oh, <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to break into the top ten, but you know, it could yeah. be hilarious for a winner. Yeah. Mm. Uh, my second pick is going to be it's going to be Napoleon, really Scott film. Nah, uh, I feel like the out. key here is it's going to be released on Apple TV Plus, which uh, that'll make sure it actually gets watched and reviewed. <laughs> All right, Dylan, my third, third, and f- third and final pick. We're not only extra wild cards here. We should, throw, we should have a third one in. 
Do you want to add a third one? We can add a third one. I feel like that would make sense, right? We have one extra. Okay, yeah, add an extra wild card. Yeah. All right, so my third and final pick will be... Uh, oh, fuck, fuck, fucking motherfucker. Um, well, it's hard, isn't it? Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, and it's even harder now, so let's do a wild card. Let's say Five Nights at Freddy's. Wow. Oh man, <laughs> I'm banking on these horror movies, not just fucking rolling cinema for the next six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're missing the point of this game. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> kind of, you're, you know, you're hoping these movies are good. <laughs> I mean, all right. No, nah, that movie's going to be number two at the box office. You wait, kids love that shit. Okay. Well, on the on the back of that guess. Uh, I'm going to make my final guess the creator. You know, if it comes out, I'm pretty I'm sure it's going to be good. Out. You know, but you've picked such trash that I'm pretty sure <laughs> even if I it doesn't come out, <laughs> I'm going to be good. So, creator. All right. What's your final wild card pick? All right, my final wild card pick. Continuing the theme. Haunted Mansion. Okay, because I think that movie is actually going to come out because they've already done their red carpet with no one. Yes, on. I, mean, I would have put that above Simeon. Five Nights at Freddy's, but in my opinion, but <laughs> whoo, that's your opinion, Ash. All right, that's your opinion. You don't know how many downloads that fucking game gets on the App Store. Okay, kids love Freddy. Um, okay, for my wild card, I'm going to pick a movie. Is going to make no money at the box office. Rebel Moon. Correct. It's definitely going to come out. I'm just yeah. banking on it being good. <laughs> and if it's not, zero points. So, yeah. Very exciting. Do you have any other films on your list that you want to chat out? <laughs> uh, the rest I had here would have been... I had some that you already said, but what wasn't said? I had... Oh, the only... I had two that weren't said. Exorcist Believer and Wonka. Mm, I also had Wonka. I also put down Dumb Money, uh, Poor Things, Drive Away Dolls, and The Killer. So, hopefully none of those come back to bite me in us. So, yeah. I'm excited to see how this pans out. I'm feeling more confident now, but... <laughs> <laughs> You feel confident until until scared. until, until none know. of those movies come out. Then I'm scared. Mm-hmm. If all of them get delayed, I'm all three on, of those I'm, movies, I'm, I'm banking yeah. on release dates here. I'm banking on sol- yeah, you, solid. Yeah, you're playing releases. it safe. Yeah, you know. You're already saying the creator is going to release in September. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Alright, uh, let's move in and give us some thumbs to trailers. Uh, of course, you can find all the trailers we're about to talk about this week in the show notes below. I'm going to kick things off with Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose, directed by Adam Sigal, uh, starring Simon Pegg, Mini Driver, Christopher Lloyd, and Neil Gaiman. When famed paranormal psychologist Dr. Nandor Fodor investigates the family's claim of a talking animal, he uncovers a mysterious web of hidden motives. Soon, everyone becomes a suspect in his relentless pursuit of the truth. Dylan, what did you think of this film about a talking mongoose? Uh, yeah, double thumbs up. I thought this looked very, uh, very interesting. Um, I straight away had to Google the the true story case of this and like what, uh, what if anything there is basis for this. Yep, certainly was a thing that happened. Apparently, um, now. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not it was real or not, that's the I guess the, the point of the movie. Um, or if it was a trick, that'll be the point of the movie. But yeah, yep, that's this is a thing that people came out and investigated, which is very funny. Uh, this is one up, one down for me. I don't know. The tone just didn't interest me that much. Interesting idea, interesting concept, and Simon Pegg looks like he's good, putting in a very dramatic performance at times. It almost comes off like psychological horror risk. At times, that's why like, I don't like it. It could be, um, but also then s- swings the other direction, be kind of comedic at times. So, uh, yeah, interesting trailer though, and interesting. I'll be interested to see the film. 
Uh, so this is slated to release in the US on the 1st of September. No Australian release date. Next trailer is for The Monkey King, directed by Anthony Stachy, starring Jimmy O. Yang, Bowen Yang, Joe Coy, Stephanie Shu, B.D. Wong. A monkey and his magical fighting stick team up on an epic quest during which they must go head-to-head against gods, demons, dragons, and the greatest enemy of all, Monkey's Own Ego. So what do you think of this upcoming Netflix animated film? Uh, Double thumbs down. Not for me. Uh, Very simplified version of this story. That's fine. I'm sure kids will like it, but yeah, I'm I'm going double thumbs down. I I didn't care for this. This is one up, one down from me. I, I I'll really enjoy the Monkey King story. Um, interestingly, uh, oh, who was it? Um, I can't believe they're ripping off Dragon Balls either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who is it? Stephen Chow is an executive producer on this film, uh, who of course did his own version of the Monkey King, um, which is much more uh, theatrical and uh, over the top. Uh, but of course, it's not in English, so you know, it doesn't count. Um, yeah, I think the, most of the animation looks good. It's just kind of the backgrounds are kind of bland. Um, you know, it definitely feels like it's on a tighter budget than a lot of the animated films we've seen recently. So hmm. uh, that's why it's a bit lower. Uh, but the car sounds good. Uh, I'm interested to watch it. So this is coming to Netflix on the 18th of August. Next trailer is for Dear David, uh, directed by John McPhail. Uh, starring Augustus Peru, Justin Long, Andrea Bang, former BuzzFeed employee Adam Ellis, who comes haunted by a ghost of a boy possessed by a demonic entity. Dylan, what do you think of this BuzzFeed trailer? Uh, Double Thumbs Down looks absolutely terrible. I hated everything about it. Um, it looks like a parody trailer, like not a real movie. Um, I remember reading the Twitter thread and everything, So, which is I would suggest just go read the Twitter thread. It's a lot more enjoyable than this trailer. Yeah, I'll have to go two thumbs down as well. Like, I like John McFowl did uh, Anna in the Apocalypse, which I really enjoyed, but this doesn't look very good. Um, especially like reading, like having, yeah, like we were there when the Adam Miller thing was happening uh, online. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, yeah, it just, it doesn't feel like it feels like an SNL sketch. Yeah. Uh, it, in the opening really anyway. And then mm-hmm. it kind of turns into a horror movie. Yeah. Um, just the over the topness of the character and that kind of stuff. So, uh, the the thing that jarred me the most, <laughs> it's such a stupid thing. Like he's like sketching on his like tablet or whatever. He's like doing several arm movements, and then the mouse does like one swipe on the screen, like of his hair. It just colors him like all this movement, and then just one thing. <laughs> it just it just didn't match up, but it was really annoying me. Uh, so yeah. Uh, this currently does not have an Australian release date. Um, I can check when it was coming out in the US. Hang on. Who cares? Coming out 13th of October in cinemas. Cool. <laughs> uh, next trailer is for Migration, directed by Benjamin Renner, uh, starring Kumal Nanjani, Elizabeth Banks, Aquafina, Keegan Michael Key, David Mitchell, Carol Kane, Jasper Jennings, Tracy Gazelle, and Danny DeVito. The Mallet family is in a bit of a rut. While Dad Mac is content to keep his family safe, paddling around their New England pond forever, Mum Pam is eager to shake things up and show their kids, teen son Dax and duckling daughter Gwen, the whole wide world. After a migrating duck family alights on the pond with thrilling tales of far-flung places, Pam persuades Mac to embark on a family trip by New York City to tropical Jamaica. Dylan, what did you think of this latest trailer for Migration? Double thumbs up. Can't wait. Look great. Um, I love the, the I love the facial animation on the ducks and everything. I was I remember when they announced it and they put that short. I was like, I don't know if I could stick with ducks for a whole movie, but I really like the way the animation has been done with this. The comedy, the the jokes about pooping and um, the the little fucker that gets run over ten times at the end. <laughs> oh, I'm ready. I can't wait. This looks great. Double thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, this two thumbs up as well. I think this was a really good trailer. Like we we got the teaser where it's like just ducks flying. Yeah. around and storming and they're hiding or whatever uh but this one like seeing ducks like go through an actual city um i love the voice cast like kumar nunjani just is not what you would expect a voice to come out of a duck <laughs> and it, it's it just works um yeah just the 
yeah, I mean, some of the humor is quite crude, I guess, like the kid not wanting to poop in front of anybody, <laughs> having to hide. Like, what if somebody's pooper. watching? Uh, yeah, all the way down there, like yeah. crazy. Um, and yeah, that that bird getting hit like several times, like classic comedy. <laughs> mm. Classic comedy works every time. It does. Uh, so migration is coming to Australian cinemas on Boxing Day. Last trailer for this week. One Piece. Developed by Matt Owens and Steve Maeda. Uh, starring Inaki Godoy, Makinio, Emily Rudd, Jacob Romero, Gibson, Taz Skyler. Uh, in a seafaring world, a young pirate captain sets out with his crew to attain the p- title of Pirate King and to discover the mythical treasure known as One Piece. Dylan, what do you think of this trailer for One Piece? What I think is this entire time I didn't realise that One Piece was called One Piece because they were chasing after something called One Piece. That's wild. There you go. Um, I'm going to go one up, one down. I think this looked better than the previous one. The I mean, there's still... There's, it's just hard. Like tra- Making anime into live action is always going to be a, a little bit of a, a struggle. But I thought like the, the fight scenes and stuff, like it definitely looks to keep the stylization of the anime fight scenes, especially um the like his uh, elastic arm attacks and whatever else uh, and that sort of stuff but it also yeah definitely looked more like a an actual structured story and not just like a um a joke (laughs) in this trailer so i'll I'll go one up one down all right uh i'm gonna two thumbs up i think it looks really good like uh i'm on board for these crazy anime adaptations i guess um it does look cartoony at times, but you know, obviously, it does is clearly live action. They've kind of changed certain things. Um, yeah, as someone who's dabbled in One Piece, uh, I think this looks really good and like uh, you know, it, look, it looks like it'll have heart and that kind of stuff. I'm getting some pretty solid performances and that kind of stuff, so I'm very keen uh, for this. So this releases on Netflix August thirty first. Let's move into this week's top three. Definitely in the top three. And in, because we've got this Barbie movie that it was a massive success, this week's top three is top three anticipated Mattel film projects. Of course, Mattel's got a bunch of things in the works. Uh, and, you know, on the riding on the high of Barbie, I'm sure they'll all be successes. So, Dylan, what's your number three? Uh, my number three is Hot Wheels. Cars. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Pretty sure it'll be worked on by Bad Robot. Um, JJ Abrams involved, so that's, yep. a, that's a solid pick. Yeah. Uh, my number three, Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Uh, so this is being worked on by Vin Diesel's One Race Film Studio. Um, and I would be down for a film that is just... Uh, real steel, but with Rock'em Sock'em robots. Yeah. Just replace Harold Hugh Jackman with Vin Diesel, I guess. It's all about family. <laughs> Dylan, what's your number two? My number two is Polly Pocket. Do you want to explain what Polly Pocket is? It's like a bunch of small toys that were targeted at little girls because they couldn't pull them out and like brush their hair and stuff and i presume that they're just going to take the success of barbie as well let's just turn any mainly female focused toy into a movie and this is another one and we'll just take the plot of barbie but we'll make it about a character called polly instead and there'll be a pocket world i don't think there's a ken though i guess i think there's just i think there's just polly and her friends like, I never had one, but I've definitely watched enough fucking trailers going off with Polly Pocket. <laughs> All right. My number two, Uno. Dylan, do you remember this headline? Little Yachty developing action heist movie based on card game Uno. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> so I did bring it up back in uh, February 2021. But yes, apparently Little Yachty is developing the Uno, Uno movie. Um, 
It says, I played Uno as a kid and still do today. So to spin that into a movie based on the Atlanta hip hop scene I came out of is really special. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, that is my number two. My number one's Uno, but it's not based on that story. (laughs) (laughs) My number one's Uno and I'll just like picture the movie. Like I want someone else doing a movie where it's like someone's playing. It's like Jumanji, but Uno. (laughs) So, like, someone's playing the game, and then, like, you know, the cards, and then, you know, you could die. You get, you know, reverse, you get more cards. I don't know. Don't, yeah. I mean, the other way to take, maybe it's a, it's a casino thing. Casino yeah, heist. Could be. Like, instead of playing poker, they play, you know, because it's more well, high just, stakes. Just go hyper-realize. Just make it a fictional, fancy world where people just play, you know, in a, like, yeah, high-stakes casino. And have it feature Barbie and Ken because it's actually a crossover franchise <laughs> with the Hot Wheels and uh, Polly Pocket movies. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. My number one, Barney. So uh, apparently Mattel has the rights to Barney and it's currently being worked on by Daniel Kaluuya, who has described it as an adult A24 type project. Uh, he said it will be surrealistic in the vein of films by Charlie Kaufman and Spike Jones. Uh, we're leaning into the millennial angst of the property rather than fine-tuning this for kids. It's really a play for adults. Not that it's R-rated, but it will focus on some of the trials and tribulations of being 30-something, growing up with Barney. That's the level of disenchantment with the generation. I'm 30-something and grew up with Barney. Sounds like a movie for us. That's why it's my <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Dylan, this week, what do you want to watch? This week, what I would love to watch is talk to me. <laughs> now, if you'd like to win tickets, <laughs> I'm sorry. If you'd like to win tickets, it's still a chance. I think maybe not. No, if it you're listening tonight. to this right as this comes out, yeah. if you're listening before tonight on Wednesday, there's still a chance to win tickets, and you can watch the movie for me. Because I'm not going to be able to watch it because it's not playing at my fucking cinema. You sure? Um, you check again? I fucking checked. Unless it pops up overnight. I checked this morning. I got all excited hoping I'd wake up to good news. Um, otherwise, Good Omens is a good thing that people should watch. Right. Uh, for me, I'm going to be watching The Beanie Bubble. Uh, of course, the story of Ty Warner and the Beanie, Beanie Babies over on Apple TV+. Plus. And watching the debut episode of season two of Heels over on Stan. Yeah. Pretty solid week. Let's know what you want to watch this week. Or what your top three Mattel films are. Uh, by going to currently explosionnetwork.com slash Twitter. Takes you to, to join us X on page. X. Yeah. Yeah. These out your thoughts. Yeah, Z-Town, fucking hell. That's um, official. They've changed it. But they now, still it still says Twitter everywhere. It's still, still tweet, but if you go to the, the about page, yeah. it says you Z-Town. That's terrible. Uh, or find us on other social media at Explosion Pod, or just jump into our Discord at explosion.com slash Discord. If you want to help us out here at What Do You Want to Watch, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on Podchaser. Leave us five stars. Any Queen, leave five stars, or just tell people that show. And if you've enjoyed this episode, thought is worth a dollar, head on over to our coach page at explosion.com slash support. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, keep watching stuff, I guess. <laughs>